Now we'll move on uh, to uh, Dr. Richard Champlin, who's going to talk to us about uh, the cellular therapy to improve allogeneic transplantation. Well, there's no, uh, no hotter area in, in medicine now is than cellular therapy, both with and, with and without hematopoietic transplantation. And I and want to try, uh, in my limited time here, to update you regarding the, you know, really the rapid evolution of uh, new opportunities in this field. And so as we all know, as we use uh, hematopoietic transplants to treat malignancies, uh, relapse of the disease is still our major problem. The whole idea of, uh, of the, the transplant has been to give high doses of chemotherapy and radiation to try to eradicate the disease, even though we uh, realize it's going to, going to uh, affect the, the patient's uh, normal cells. But we again then can either use uh, autologous or allogeneic uh, donor cells to restore hematopoiesis post-transplant. But despite this, uh, we know that the, realistically the high-dose therapy doesn't really kill the disease in most patients. And uh, evidence for this is if you do an identical twin transplant, uh, there's a much higher risk of relapse than with an allogeneic donor. And if you take T cells out of the allogeneic transplant, there's a higher risk as well. So the, the benefit is somehow being mediated by the allogeneic T cells, eradicating minimal residual disease. So what really happens with an allogeneic transplant is that we give the patient, again, here's a recipient with leukemia cells and normal cells, we give the high-dose preparative regimen and, and the transplant, and then afterwards we, we really haven't killed every last uh, leukemia cell and there's still some normal cells remaining as well. And then the, the donor cells we're counting on to mediate, again, this anti-tumor effect, uh, again, eradicating the disease as well as residual host hematopoiesis. So there's a, an opportunity, if you will. Can we modulate this immune reactivity process? Can we do cellular immune manipulations or immune therapies uh, to boost this immune anti-tumor effect? And if we do uh, transplants for, for patients with really any disease, this is acute myeloid leukemia, people in remission do reasonably well, but still 20 or 30 percent of those people relapse. And everyone with more advanced disease has a higher risk of, of recurrent disease. And of people with overt uh, malignancies at the time of the transplant, uh, usually only, only about 20 percent of them are long-term survivors. So clearly we need a lot better treatment to treat the under, underlying malignancy. So the, uh, this graft versus malignancy effect, unfortunately, is relatively weak. Uh, again, in AML, if you have active disease, uh, only 20 percent of people are, are, are cured. So is there ways that we can, can boost it? You know, the, the benefit of the graft versus malignancy is associated with graft versus host disease. Obviously, that's not a desirable endpoint. We want to separate those two processes. And, and relapse is still our, our main cause of treatment failure. Uh, we also have infections that can occur, uh, despite uh, and that occur to complicate the transplant, and this is related to post-transplant immune deficiency. So as we're thinking about cell therapies, it would be good to have cell therapies as well that could reduce the risk of these serious infections. And Dr. Parmer is going to actually talk about graft-versus-host disease and Treg cells, so I'm going to quickly skip through this, this part. Um, actually, I'm going to go back to one, uh, one uh, this, this area of this presentation. Um, so one of the things that would be nice is if we had a way that we could turn off graft-versus-host disease uh, if it occurs. So the, the a thought was to, can we put a suicide switch in, into T cells? So can we genetically modify T cells to have a gene that will kill the T cell if it's causing graft-versus-host disease? Well, this has been done. Uh, actually, there's two products. One, uh, one old one, the herpes virus thymidine kinase, uh, which is, uh, is the aspect of the herpes virus that allows it to be killed with acyclovir or gancyclovir. If we put that gene in, in, into T cells, you could then treat the patient with uh, gancyclovir and kill every one of those T cells. And, and that actually works, but that, that technology just has not uh, been effective overall. The modifications of the cells has, has impaired their function, and you know, over the last 20 years, this really hasn't moved forward in, into prime time. But now there's a new, new agent, a modified caspase 9, uh, that appears more promising. So here's the, the idea. So basically we, we, uh, we modify a T cell with a retrovirus to introduce the uh, modified caspase 9. This is a caspase 9 that is inactive. It doesn't work, it doesn't kill the cell, unless you give a, another drug with it, a drug called AP1903, which is a dimerizing uh, agent. It dimerizes the caspase now to an active form, and then the activated caspase kills the cell. 
So basically, you give the cells uh, in a donor lymphocyte infusion or part of your transplant. If the patient gets graft-versus-host disease, um, then you can give the AP1903, the dimerizing agent. It dimerizes the caspase, and then all of the modified cells are killed, and graft-versus-host disease stops in its tracks. And indeed, uh, this has been done in a clinical trial. Uh, uh, Dr. Destasi, uh, at the time at Baylor, had, had done this, uh, where they gave patients a donor lymphocyte infusions from a haploidentical donor. Uh, shortly thereafter, many of them got graft versus host disease. They treated the patient with the AP1903, and you can see this is the number of the transduced cells that they could see in the blood. It drops instantly uh, to very low levels. And uh, coincident with that, they see improvements in the symptoms of graft-versus-host disease. So here's, here's a patient. Um, uh, the, from, this is just from their publication in, in the New England Journal. You can see the skin rash. You have to have your, uh, an imagination to see the rash, but uh, there's a skin rash there. And the bilirubin level had gone up. And they gave the AP1903, and you can see the bilirubin no normalizes very quickly. And the rash disappears just within 24 hours. So this is, uh, this is uh, just hard to believe for those of us who treat graft-versus-host disease. With corticosteroids, only half the people respond, and usually it takes, uh, takes one to two weeks to see resolution of, of the manifestations. And so this was a, a small study, a proof of principle, but this is a very exciting approach that now is going forward into, into larger clinical trials. So as I mentioned, you know, we see a lot of viral infections that complicate hematopoietic transplants. Many of these can be life-threatening. Many of the viruses do not have effective antiviral drug therapies. And if we could introduce T cells uh, that could effectively handle these infections, it would be a major advance. And there's really two ways uh, to do this. One is called the gamma capture technique. One can, if there's a high frequency of T cells in the peripheral blood of a normal donor, you can collect those cells. Um, by phoresis, and then select out the cells that would, would produce gamma interferon in response to viral antigens. And for Epstein Barr virus or cytomegalovirus, this has actually been done. You then collect those cells and give those as a donor lymphocyte infusion, and it can then uh, treat either EBV, uh, lymphoproliferative disease, or cytomegalovirus infections. And there's been reports of success uh, doing this. Another uh, uh, approach done by our colleagues uh, at, at, um, at across the street at Baylor, Dr. Bollard, who works with Dr. Schwal, um, you know, has developed a whole panel of T cells reactive against a number of viral targets. They actually make trivirus-specific uh, T cells reactive against CBV, EBV, rather, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, and adenovirus. Same technologies could be used for BK virus and HHV6. One can, over a relatively short period of time, culture cells and expand them, producing large numbers of, of viral-specific uh, T cells. And that these have been successful in preliminary studies in treating refractory patients with these, uh, these viral infections. So the initial studies do indicate the feasibility and, and uh, success, uh, uh, suggest efficacy, and they're, they're particularly effective for EBV lymphoproliferative disease. And these uh, specific um, uh, effector cells are much less likely to cause graft-versus-host disease that can occur after a, a standard donor lymphocyte infusion. Uh, one of the problems has, has been just the long time it takes to produce these cells in, in culture, but rapid production techniques have, have recently been developed, and now it's possible to produce cultured cells in as little as two weeks. Um, one of the, the problems with giving these CTLs is, is that if the patient's on steroids, uh, the, the steroids will kill the cells. And so uh, many of the patients who have these type of refractory viral infections also have graft-versus-host disease, and so that's been a major, major problem. And so realistically, they're more useful in preventing these kinds of infections and then treating them, in, at least in people with GVHD. One of the, the you know, problems, much as Dr. Kwok had talked about, is if you're making a donor-specific product, you have to make a new one for each patient, which has its logistics and cost uh, issues. And one of the, the big, uh, big hopes is that we can produce off-the-shelf third-party CTLs that could be given uh, to, to any patient, and there's a number of, uh, of uh, approaches underway to do, to do just that. But that's, uh, that's a developing technology not uh, presently ready for prime time. All right, what, what about now the anti-tumor effects? And uh, we've used donor lymphocyte infusions uh, for a long time. These have been effective, but have the risk of graft-versus-host disease. Can we, uh, can we 
focus uh, the lymphocyte uh, reactivity by developing antigen-specific CTLs that target the malignancy, and then uh, more recently using chimeric antigen receptors to, uh, to generate, again, tumor-specific T cells, even against relatively non-immunogenic -immun targets, and I'll show you uh, these in a moment. So uh, again, with uh, donor lymphocyte infusions, this is an effective treatment for a variety of malignancies and uh, particularly EBV lymphoproliferative disease. Uh, it's effective for CML and indolent lymphoid malignancies, but less effective for uh, acute leukemias and aggressive uh, lymphomas. Um, there's been planned DLI studies uh, used uh, to enhance these graft-versus malignancy effects, giving the cells early post-transplant, but they're frequently complicated by graft-versus host disease, and, and so that's our major challenge is can we get the benefit without the, the toxicity of GVHD? Well, what are, what are the targets? Well, we'd like to, to target the malignancy specifically, but the tumor-related antigens such as the BCR-able peptide, the fusion peptide related to that translocation or idiotype that Dr. Kwok had discussed, they're relatively weak antigens. You don't, don't generate a very potent or strong immune response uh, against them. Uh, there's also apparently expressed uh, normal uh, antigens, and actually Dr. Moldrum in our group uh, has uh, looked at proteinase 3, it's a, it's a um, protein present in, in primary granules of uh, neutrophils and promyelocytes, and it's aberrantly expressed. I mean, it's abnormally expressed in leukemia cells, so it's, it really presents itself just like a leukemia-related antigen, and T cells reactive against the PR1 epitope of proteinase 3 actually kills leukemia specifically and, and with little effect on normal hematopoiesis. Other, other targets of this nature include WT1 that's uh, commonly used uh, as another, another target. Now, in terms of allogeneic targets, um, there's sort of two kinds. One is the, the broadly reactive uh, targets. So these are, are antigens present throughout the body. They might be present on the malignancy, but they're also on your skin and liver and GI tract. Those would be targets that would also produce graft-versus-host disease. So we really don't want to target, focus on those. But we, it would be OK to uh, focus on lineage-restricted targets like hematopoietic antigens. So something that's on, on white blood cells and leukemias, of course, would be OK. You don't care if you kill your normal white blood cells uh, of the recipient because they're being replaced by cells from the, from the donor. So in this uh, situation, we could, could try to target those related antigens. This is a, it's a better slide showing the same thing. This is one of, one of St uh, Stan Riddell's uh, publications. Again, so we want these cells. We want these cells that target the leukemia. They can also target normal hematopoietic cells of the recipient that are going to be replaced by the transplant. But we don't want these cells, these cells that target the skin, liver, and GI tract. Even if they kill leukemia cells, they're going to cause graft-versus-host disease. So uh, Dr. Moldrum, as I mentioned, uh, has developed PR1 CTLs. This is proteinase-3-related antigens. And again, he's shown that he can eradicate leukemia in mice, uh, you know, human leukemias in, in mouse models, by use of these cells without affecting normal hematopoiesis. And so we're developing a vaccine uh, as well as a, a CTL cell therapy based upon this technology that we're taking forward. Now, what's, what's really the hottest thing, uh, probably in, in cancer medicine, is these chimeric antigen receptor T cells. So the idea here is you, you create a, a artificial T cell receptor. You, you make a monoclonal antibody against a, a target, this is, so you can do this in mice, and you can target a, a protein that's not immunogenic in, in man, say CD19, the uh, protein present on, on B cells and B cell malignancies. And so you take the variable sequence of the antibody and you graft it to the zeta chain of the T cell receptor. So here's our chimeric, chimeric antigen receptor. So when this binds to CD19, it's going to turn on the T cell, and a T cell is going to kill the tumor cell. So now you've, you've redirected the T cell away from whatever its natural target would be now to react against CD19 and, and then um, specifically target both normal and malignant cells that have that antigen. So there's a number of different ways to produce these cells using uh, various kinds of uh, viral vectors. Uh, lentivirus, retroviral vectors have been commonly used. We've actually used a, a non-viral system called Sleeping Beauty developed by uh, Dr. Cooper in our group. And we've also developed uh, artificial antigen presenting cells to help this process along. And this is the uh, Sleeping Beauty system where just with plasmids you have a transpose ace that you know, is a, functions like a virus to break the, the recipient 
uh, DNA, and then you insert your trans transposon, which is the gene of interest, uh, into the DNA of the, of the target cell. And so it's a non-viral system. It doesn't have all of the risks uh, in inherent, inherent to a retrovirus or a lentivirus, and it's, it's uh, cost-effective, a much cheaper way to, uh, to achieve this goal, and, and very effective in, in, in transducing the cells. The, um, the next uh, advance in this whole field had been de developing ways that these modified cells will survive and function in vivo. When you just give the, the first generation cells that just had the chimeric antigen receptor, they generally didn't last long. They died off quickly and, and didn't survive in the patient. But now we, we put in a co-stimulatory molecules such as CD28 or 41BB as part of the construct. And then these cells now have prolonged uh, survival in the patients, and they actually expand in, in vivo. The use of the an artificial antigen presenting cells allows us to grow these cells and expand them in vitro, and we can produce large cell doses. So we can target, uh, again, non-immunogenic targets. This has been most effective in targeting CD19 in B cells malignancies, including lymphoma, CLL, and ALL. The second and uh, third generation pr uh, products I told you enhance their survival in the patient. But this is still area, an area of rapid uh, development, and uh, the optimal design of the, of the chimeric antigen receptor uh, cells, it still has, has to be developed, and all these issues I listed here need, need to be considered. But these are in the clinic, and they're, and they're very effective. They've been given in a number of settings. Uh, usually one has to give lymphodepleting chemotherapy to keep these cells from being suppressed by natural uh, immune regulatory processes and allow them to expand in vivo uh, physiologically. And one has seen complete remissions in patients with advanced diseases. Uh, so it's been effective in eradicating CD19 positive cells in CLL, in ALL, and so, in some lymphomas. Uh, Helen Heslop just recently uh, presented an update of all of the people treated in the world to date, and it was about 32 people in, in non-transplant trials, and, and there have been three complete remissions and 10 partial remissions. So it doesn't work every time. There's still a lot that needs to be worked out, but uh, these were three, uh, three very dramatic remissions in far advanced patients. One of the interesting things is, is you see durable elimination of the, of the CD19 normal cells get this to go backwards. And, and so this really shows the potency of this. When you give rituxan, your CD19 cells, you know, B cells disappear, but they come back. When you give these chimeric antigen receptor cells, there's a number of, of people with durable complete remissions in their disease who have no CD19 cells in their body. Um, they've been eradicated by this, uh, this approach, and the patients need to receive in intravenous immune globulin uh, to restore B cell function. This is uh, the report from Carl June's group uh, in a patient with CLL. You can just look in the middle here. You see the CLL in the bone marrow, and it's progressively cleared um, from the bone marrow and as well as nodal disease in, in this patient. This is one of their, their complete remissions that they've noted in that study. Now, these, this is not a, a treatment without toxicity, and uh, particularly with uh, Carl June's um, as construct, he has 4-1-BB as the co-stimulatory molecule, and he sees enormous expansion of these cells in vivo. And usually about two to three weeks after giving the cells, those cells now expand to the point where they produce a cytokine storm syndrome, where patients will have fever, often pulmonary infiltrates, they may even develop respiratory failure as a, a manifestations of the cytokine production. And IL-6 is one of the major cytokines involved with this, and now they actually are giving uh, um, inhibitors of IL-6 uh, to treat th this complication in those patients. So we need to really see how, how best to produce these cells, what is the best co-stimulatory co molecule. We may not want this violent an expansion of the cells in, in vivo because it does produce toxicities, but these cells can induce uh, dramatic remissions. So one of the problem areas, should we be using autologous or allogeneic cells? We're doing this with allogeneic cells. They're normal cells that are much more easy to, to produce in the laboratory and can boost the effects of the allogeneic transplant. Um, how can we get them to survive at home to the tumor? And, uh, and how can we deal with these toxicities? One of the, the big concerns, again, is can we produce off-the-shelf cells? So one of the problems is you, you give these, uh, these cells from a third party, they're going to be rejected. The, the host is going to see uh, HLA molecules on the, on the, the T cells and, and reject them. So if we find a way to knock out the expression of the HLA molecules, then that would not happen. 
the uh, T cells could cause graft versus host disease through their natural T cell receptor. Keep in mind, they still have their whatever, is, uh, whatever the antigen is that they would normally uh, react to, that's still present. But we can uh, knock out the endogenous T cell receptor and then just have neutral cells, if you will, that won't be rejected or cause graft versus host disease that could cause the anti tumor immunity. So that's the goal within our program, and it's a, it's a project led by Lawrence Cooper. Now, lastly, NK cells are a very, um, very exciting uh, cell population for uh, cell therapy. These are parts of the innate immune system. I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to try to go, go quickly through this. Uh, they don't have a T cell receptor, but they're go governed by activating and inhibitory receptors. And the um, so-called missing ligand uh, model at least predicts cytotoxicity in, in vivo, in vitro. But in clinical trials, this missing ligand model has not really predicted the uh, clinical outcomes. And that's probably because activating receptors are, are much more important in, for these in vivo effects. Uh, there's a recent review by uh, Bill Murphy that was just uh, presented at the tandem meetings uh, last week. Uh, this is the reference. You can review the, uh, the ligands that activate and inhibit NK cells. But these cells are, are very potent killers of, uh, of hematologic malignancies and are very exciting cells for transplants because NK cells directly kill leukemia cells. They kill antigen-presenting host cells in the host that can, can stimulate graft-versus-host disease. They kill T cells in the host that could cause graft, or that could cause graft rejection. So this is the greatest thing you can imagine for transplants. We can add these, uh, these cells in to enhance the anti-tumor effects, prevent graft-versus-host disease, and prevent rejection at the same time. So they're very exciting cells uh, for hematopoietic uh, transplantation. You can collect them from the peripheral blood of donors, but you can't get very many. So that's been one of, one of our, our problems in using these cells therapeutically. Their NK cells are present in only 5 to 15 percent of the cells in, in normal donors. And with a large-scale apheresis, you only get about a million of them per kilo, and that really isn't enough to do any, any major damage against the, uh, the patient's malignancy. So we've developed a, a system, this has been done by Dean Lee in our program, where we can get four log expansion of NK cells uh, using an ex vivo uh, antigen presenting cell system uh, with uh, interleukin-21 present on the cells. And with the uh, bioreactors, we can produce these cells now in large number. And we're going forward with clinical trials, both in transplants, where we're adding these NK cells either to a matched or a haploidentical transplant, or in the non-transplant setting, where we're either treating leukemia, CLL, or myeloma with, uh, with, uh, with high doses of, or standard doses of, of chemotherapy plus NK cells to augment the anti-tumor effect. So ultimately, we're, we can now get into an era where we can design a, a transplant or a cell therapy to include the cells we want, the anti-tumor uh, reactive cells, antiviral reactive cells, and eliminate alloreactive cells that could potentially cause graft-versus-host disease, really to optimize the results in ind individual patients. So uh, in conclusion, uh, adoptive cellular therapy is a promising novel treatment modality for the treatment of cancer, and it really is a, a true different a form of treatment. It's a unique modality in its own right. Cellular immune therapy is a promising approach to control alloreactivity. You're going to hear about this from Dr. Parmar. And antigen-specific CTLs and CAR T cells can eradicate uh, pre experimental tumors, and preliminary clinical trials have been performed with both autologous and allogeneic cells, producing, in many cases, dramatic activity and feasibility uh, with or without hematopoietic transplantation. So it's an exciting time for this uh, general approach and treatment, and we're all expecting big things just within the next few years with, uh, with all the cells that I've discussed. Thank you.